Awesome. So thank you, everybody, for the introduction. Uh, also, very big thanks to the GSA team for inviting me, for Drew's, for organizing everything. Um, the name of this talk and how I would like to, to start the introduction is I'm good at JavaScript, I swear. I, I think this, uh, to me, my name is Jose Aguinaga. I've been coding JavaScript for around seven years or so. A little, little after Netscape Navigator, so at least the internet, I was very happy when Internet Explorer came out, believe it or not. I also started working a little bit with um, iframes back then. They were also pretty, pretty exciting. And then later on, when, when some, some of these frameworks, prototype jQuery started coming out, I was so hype about it. So I'm going to be talking not only about the technologies, but also how us as developers, as web developers, engineers, People are learning JavaScript, approach JavaScript. And I think, to me, it's a very exciting topic. All right? So who am I? As I mentioned before, my name is Jose Aguinaga. You can find me in JJ Perse Aguinaga. As I mentioned before, I'm a web engineer. I've been working with multiple startups um, from the US. I recently relocated from San Francisco, California. I'm currently working in Switzerland, uh, Zurich for FinTech Company. Previously, I was in Canada. Germany and Mexico, where I am originally from. I focus mostly on startups, so I, this, the current company I'm working for is the fifth startup. I work mostly on fintech and I also have an interest in privacy. Most of my web knowledge has been focused on working with teams and, so to speak, raising them from the very beginning, sort of like setting up uh, all the frameworks, the code language, the code standards, code reviews to actually developing a product to uh, launch of them. Um, I also have happened to write an article in 2016. So I'm going to do a, a little exercise. Can you raise your hand if you have seen this picture before? All right. So this picture is from a cover of an article that I wrote in mid-October. It's called How It Feels to Learn JavaScript in 2016. And maybe you have read it or not. If you haven't read it, it's fine. The article is about two people talking. And one of them is a non-technical people. The other, or well, I mean, somewhat technical people. But the other person is uh, you know, like this JavaScript expert. And the non-technical per uh, person asks him, as the JavaScript expert, um, you know, I just want to display this, this, this web page, this status display. How do I do it? And the JavaScript guy is like, I got this. You know, you need to add jQuery, React, Babel, TypeScript, Angular, Webpack. And it's just bombarding him with this incredibly amount of, of, of frameworks and libraries that us as web developers probably have a struggle a little bit about it. And funny enough, it was just a real story that I had with a friend. After three, the, 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 the only thing that is not real is after three questions, he was like, you know what, forget it. I'm just going to do something else. But the funny thing about that story is that actually was the, the most shared thing that I ever did in my entire life, by far. I had my 15 minutes of fame, and then eventually people move on, as with everything with the internet. But the reason why I'm sharing you this is because I, I found during my 15 minutes of fame that a lot of people felt like that. A lot of people felt that the JavaScript ecosystem was very heavy, that if you wanted to learn, if you wanted to do front-end in 2016, you needed to learn all these very complex libraries or all these very complex tools in order to just get a, a party started, so to speak. Um, when I started doing uh, JavaScript a long time ago, you could just drop your document.write and hope nothing breaks, and now you need to add all these um, very complex libraries, uh, to be honest. But what I, what I want to talk about is not necessarily that, but um, just how people felt the response. And for instance, the, this was one of my favorite response was, no JavaScript frameworks were created during the writer of this article. And the favorite was like, I very much doubt that. And back then, I was in San Francisco when I was coding this, uh, when I was writing this article. And I remember when I published it and, and it called Share and everything, 
I had a friend from Facebook write me, and he's like, you might need to update that article. And I'm like, why? And he's like, well, we're working on something to replace NPM. And NPM is this huge repository manager that we have, that we have been working for years. I, don't, I have yet to meet someone that says, I love NPM. If there's NPM sponsors over here, I didn't say that. But it's, it's part of a thing that we are really working with, and it's one of the fundamental pieces that I think modern web development relies on. So I was like, no, there's no way we're going to replace it. Like, I just wrote that article. Like, come on. And then eight days later, uh, like, ah, oh, come on. And then, I mean, of course, if you are doing, you know, NPM or repository management, I, I suggest recommend Yarn, which is pretty good. I'm not saying replace NPM, but take a look. Another funny reaction is I make this joke that it's so complex to make um, a web page today that if you want to display a web page, it's actually you know, easier to perform sub-zero regional Mortal Kombat fatality. For those of you who didn't have a childhood, uh, Mortal Kombat was this th Street Fighter-like video game that you had when you won. You needed to perform this complex up, down, right, left in order to finish the, the, the other person, right? Now, when I was a kid, of course, this, this was a long time ago, when I was a kid, this was super complex. But then I had a friend, a reader of the article, uh, reach me, and he was like, actually, it's not that complex. The fatality of Sub-Zero is like, right, up, there, right, high punch. And I was like, oh, well, I mean, I was a kid. I was like probably like six, seven years old. Of course, that was complex. And then I realized, well, if you want to develop, let's say, a desktop application with JavaScript technologies, then, well, you need to, <laughs> to use all these libraries. So that joke doesn't really stand anymore because it's actually more complex to do that nowadays than actually perform sub-zero original more than combat fatality. Um, but jokes aside, I think to me the most um, insightful response was from Adi Osmani. Uh, he's a Google developer, uh, tech advocate. I think a lot of few people may or may not know him. And he says, well, look, I get your frustration. I get that, you know, JavaScript can be a little bit overwhelming. You know, I, I think all these libraries can be very hard to get it started. But if you just do it first, <laughs> like first try, you know, like don't discourage the beginners, don't discourage the talent. And this uh, web development is this huge intimidating monster. But instead, just just try it with like a simple JavaScript, no libraries, not anything. Then try to do it right, and then try to do it better. You're you're good. You don't have to tackle the entire ecosystem. Um, all at once, but just make sure that at least give it a try. And even though I love that article, to me, the, or when I love that approach from, from, uh, from Adi, I keep asking myself, when is it right? Because, hear me out here. I've been coding for nine years, 10 years, full-time. I'm talking about full-time JavaScript engineer working for multiple startups, as I mentioned before in Canada, um, in, in Switzerland, in San Francisco. I, I even taught uh, web programming in Indonesia. And I still don't feel this amazing JavaScript developer that you know, there, there are these guys speaking conference about. And I keep asking myself, when am I going to be this amazing JavaScript developer? Right? Like I, I, as many of you, I have attended mel multiple conferences. I look at the guy giving the conference, and I'm like, yeah, when am I going to be? I'm here, and I still don't feel like it. And I keep asking myself, is it going to be when I completely understand, you know, all these super quirks about JavaScript, the secrets like, oh, you know, how the scope works and, you know, how the, um, how do you do this super random interview questions that I have yet to use in any of my works that they ask, you know, like, how, how is Hoister feature works? And I'm like, I have no idea what you just said. Um, and is it because when I know all the, li all the JavaScript languages, like if, if, you, if you go to a job interview and somebody asks you, oh, how do you use Angular or Septo or React, like that person will never finish the list because we are creating, there's this game, there's drinking game. I don't know if you know that if it's called Noun.js, yes, that if you Google a noun and if you find a noun you are supposed to drink, don't play it because there is JavaScript libraries for every single noun in the English dictionary. If you don't believe me, lady on the party hour, we can play it. I'm not going to play it. Um, and, I, and, I keep, and I keep learning you know, all these advancements in, in programming, not only in JavaScript, but also functional programming, and standard programming, and structural programming, reactive programming. Like, I'm running out of programming, and I still keep asking myself when I'm going to be. And it's, it's just feel uh, um, a 
kind of a goose chase. Like, I will never be this amazing developer tool because there's just so many tools that are around. And to me, or the approach that I take about this is, well, I need to know everything. If I know everything, I will be good. And I, you know, the people that are paying me lots of money to do their web page and their applications, they will feel that the work is, is, is worth it. But I think this mentality is, is a little bit wrong. In, when I was in San Francisco, they, they did this, um, they had this super, uh, super posh term that is called fear of missing out. And they usually use it on startups. When you are doing an investment on a startup, say, um, all these big VCs, companies, venture capitals, that they want to invest money on the next Uber, the next Tesla, the next Dropbox, they have this term called fear of missing out. And it's, it's kind of a pervasive impression that others are having a better deal uh, that you're, you might have if you don't, you don't join it. So if you are not learning React today, oh, you, you, you're not a good JavaScript developer. If you don't know the latest Angular 2.0, have you heard it's better at 1.x? So you need to learn that. And I think that's one of the pains of this, this constant having to learn everything. At what point do you stop? The next, for the next 40 minutes or so, I want to talk about what this fear of missing, missing out does, what it does to us as a, as a community, what it does um, as developers in our jobs, and how to battle it, and how to identify it, and you know, how it's still moving forward. One of, one of the, one of, I, I keep hearing that, I mean, when I was in San Francisco, I was very lucky because um, I live in Switzerland, I live in a town that has 32,000 people. So you don't stumble upon a lot of people talking about technologies, but in San Francisco, you go to a Starbucks coffee and you have people everywhere talking about this thing and you hear like, React is way better than Angular. Let's move everything to React. And you're like, why? Um, Another one, Webpack will free us from make files. When I was there, we were doing oral tooling. So make files is this super old um, build tooling mechanism that's been back in the day, and it's still very useful. Like If you use it, go for it, because I love it. But the syntax can be a little bit tricky, right? And then somebody's like, Webpack came, and you know, like Webpack will free us from everything. And then if you have maintained a Webpack project, it's just not that easy anymore. And then, a more modern one, uh, Fusebox is better than Webpack. If you don't know uh, what Fuxus big, uh, Fusebox is, it's fine. <laughs> it's completely fine. This is a tool that came like three months ago that it's better than Webpack because it has TypeScript included. If you don't know what TypeScript included, you're fine as well. <laughs> so what this mentality of fear of missing out does to you, um, why it can be bad? and how to work with it. That's what I'm going to be talking for the next 40 minutes or so. So what it does, and I put it this, I, I, I am cheating because I'm putting the answer over there. If you have heard about imposter syndrome, you will know what I mean when you're constantly being apprehensive by the fact that you might not be the best or you might not know the latest Java, um, JavaScript library you want. Um, so when I started in, in Canada, when I was uh, doing some of my first jobs in Canada, I was working with NoCowGS. So raise your hand if you know what NoCowGS is. Yay, I'm not at all, awesome. So NoCowGS was super awesome at the time because I think it was the very first library that was doing two-way data binding. And what that means is that you were able to update the model on your website at the same time that the view. And back then, that was just like mind blowing. I remember like showing that and people were like, what, you're typing and it's just going back and forth. And you know, my ego back then, I was probably my second job, so my ego was like, oh, you know, I'm this, this JavaScript developer, I'm showing people the world. Um, relocated to Switzerland, uh, I was already did some work in the US, and of course, uh, the US, I, I was working in Minnesota in the middle of nowhere, but I didn't say that, I was just like, I come from the US. And I was working in Switzerland, I was like, yeah, let me show you how we do that in North America. Like, come on. Um, and I was using AngularJS, which of course back then was in pre-alpha one. I think the, um, Harry Gregor was still, was some of the developer, the original developers before they joined Google, they were working with AngularJS, and of course, again, it was amazing. Um, it had a little bit of complexity, I have to admit. You had to learn services, factories, and all these Java terms that people at Google love. And, but the, as soon as you get around that, you can do very powerful things, and again, I was, Back then, I was working in this company in Switzerland. I was getting promoted. I was, suddenly, I was tech leader of some fancy title I don't remember anymore. 
And I was teaching teams how to use Angular. I was getting invitations to speak in conferences, to write books. I even have a, uh, um, an article defending Angular and whatnot, right? Um, so I was feeling good, pretty good about myself. Then I got this job offer in California, and I was like, OK, I'm just going to try to get myself back a little bit in, in the San Francisco, in the really heart of the startup ecosystem. Um, but back then, but by then, React was already taking momentum, right? So you have the thing that for two or three years, I did only Angular, only Angular. I could only speak with controllers, models, services, views. I was just like, oh, you know, your controller is outdated. And people were like, what's that controller? Like, you don't know Angular. Um, <laughs> when React came, it was, uh, you know, forget all that stuff. We have the super view, this is the GXX uh, view. It's almost like HTML, but not like HTML, but you can still use it. And I was, I, I got hard, and I was already learning React JS, but I was very negative against React JS because, of course, I've been working with Angular for many years, so I could. She was like, "Oh, wait, it's so good, you know? My scope can do that, my service can do that." Um, but of course, um, the, the ecosystem move on. A lot of people find it more useful, and I was forced, so to speak, to work in React JS, and. After having five, six, seven years of experience, feeling very, a very competent uh, JavaScript developer, I was suddenly sitting um, with kids going out of college, just working on React amazingly fast, faster than I am doing this incredible application, <laughs> and I felt like the old grandpa. I was like, I was like, it was like this kid's like 19, and it's already like crushing login forms, and I'm like, what's Redux? Googling that. And of course, that shattered my ego. That shattered my confidence as a developer. I was, I was hired as a senior tech-led lead front-end developer, and I was having people everywhere around me faster than me and better than me in many ways. And I was just praying they don't find out. And I was like, no, 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 it's, it's fine. And at some point, I just, just got this, this, this um, invitation to teach in, in Indonesia to do this, this boot camp so people can do that. And when they were teaching JavaScript, they were teaching with jQuery. If you don't know, it's a, it's, it's a super simple library to manipulate DOM um, or browsers interactions. And it's among the, the easiest things you can do. But I haven't used jQuery in years. And they had all their teaching material and was in jQuery. And the day before, they didn't tell me. And the day before, I was like Googling up how to do Ajax request in jQuery. And I'm like, ah, I'm a failure, I'm a failure, I'm a failure. And I, I, I took a deep breath, um, came back, that eventually you read about your crazy, it's fine. Um, then I, 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 for other, other reasons, I decided to move back to Switzerland. And of course, they're using TypeScript. And, and I told them, you look, I have five, 10 years of experience. Of course, I can do TypeScript. Relocate to Switzerland. <laughs> Three months later, like, what's a closure? What's object programming? And of course, it, I mean, it was just job after job that I had to really, I go through the interview, I could show that my basis, my fundamental of knowledge was good because I, I consider myself a somewhat good JavaScript programmer, I, I swear. <laughs> but of course, if, if you are challenged yourself against new technologies every once in a while, you don't feel confident, you, don't, you feel like a failure, you don't feel that you have enough skills. This was me after three jobs, I was just had no confidence. I just like asking everybody to check my code review. It's just like, hey, is this okay? I'm like, yeah, of course. I'm like, well, I don't know. And <laughs> see, so, so I, I came to the conclusion, we'll never know enough. I will never know all the tools that are coming up. I will never know all the, you know, all the frameworks that are going out. But that doesn't mean I'm bad. That doesn't mean that I'm and I'm, I'm a bad programmer, I stumbled upon this, this, this term, and I was like, yes, imposter syndrome. So it's the inability to internalize their accomplishment, according to Wikipedia, while having a person's fear of being exposed as a fraud. And it's, it's a very common phenomenon, in, I think, in a lot of environments, in a lot of in, in, in ecosystems, where people feel that they, overachievers feel that they don't have what it takes to do the job. Um, and a lot of, a lot, to me, um, when I was talking with some people, especially in a very challenging environment such as San Francisco, where there's constant pressure, so to speak, peer pressure as, a, as an engineer to be the best, to go in this conference, to be in this new Medium article that your, your, your project got shared on Hacker News or whatever, 
you, you, you compare yourself to all these unicorns, so to speak, and then you feel you're bad. And those were some of the questions that, I'm, that you should be asking if you may or may not have imposter syndrome. You think your code is always inferior? Um, do you feel you're worth less than your coworkers? And, and to me, the, the, the same approach to this is, or how I, I got over that is, if you're always starting from step one, of course you're going to be you're going to feel less if you are always learning something good, which is good. I don't want you to tell like, oh, you cannot ever overcome and just stop. Let's all go back to jQuery now. Just not move from there. No, what I'm trying to tell you is that it's fine feeling like you don't know because that is the point of learning. Um, a good example that I like is, yes, so, awesome. so oh yeah, so, <laughs> See, that's why I have my speakers. So we are faced with a constant conflict of showcasing this knowledge that we have. So um, I, I have to prove to my boss that I know what I'm doing. At the same time, always be learning because the ecosystem is always changing. So I have to be open and humble enough to see a framework, let's say Erlang, for whatever reason I want to learn this beautiful functional programming that I have zero experience with. And I have to make a case that I can do both, that I can be professional enough to do the project that I'm asked for and I'm paid for, at the same time being open enough to tackle on the new, the new technologies that are coming to my brain. And that is such a different mindset. In one of them, you have to be super confident. You have to come here and you know give presentations and talk about it. And in the other one, you need to be Google in terms like, uh, what's functional programming? And that's just not be ashamed and not try to do it in a corner because that's completely fine. Um, my favorite example on that is language learning. Um, I'm originally from Mexico, so that means that my native language is Spanish, not Mexican, as some people said yesterday. And I live in the U.S. Uh, for some time, so to me it was easy to, to learn English, and especially um, it, we're so close to the United States that a lot of things are in English. Uh, so I was, again, I was building my confidence. I was like, oh, I can do Japanese as well. And I was like studying some Japanese, which... It's not very useful because then I move in Europe and yeah, well, not, not very useful to learn Japanese. But then I started learning German and oh my God, German is such a hard language. And I had no, there was like a German person like, ha ha ha, of course it is. And I had to go from, you know, speaking in fluent English to being like, ich bin ein Kasse and makes no sense. And just you, you, you drop yourself from this like super, um, confident person, you're an adult, to speak like a baby. Because if you want to really adopt a language and you really want to immerse yourself in the language, you need to learn as, a, as a little kids learn. And I think one, people say, oh, you cannot learn a language after you are X years old. And I don't think that is the case. I just think our mentality to make failures to see as childs just disappears as you grow up. Because as you grow up, you're expected more to behave as an adult, and you're expected more to make less mistakes. You're supposed to be like a functioning adult in this world, but you're still saying like, ich bin ein Kasse. So that, that again, is, is that contrast. I'm now learning Italian, and I still <laughs> make those mistakes, even though Italian is way easier to me as, as, as a Spanish person. Uh, I was actually went out yesterday, and I had... Um, I was trying to speak, order the food in Italian, and was feeling confident. And the waiter, after I pay, he was like, oh, grazie mille. And I said, ah, prego cento, which <laughs> apparently that's not what you're supposed to say to the waiter. And my girlfriend, who, who is here, and she's Italian, and she was just laughing at me. And I was like, well, isn't supposed to be like nice. Like, no, you don't say that. It's like, ah, oh. and you know, I'm working on that. So bear with me. So that's one of the first things. Um, Another topic that comes a lot when we're talking about the JavaScript ecosystems is JavaScript fatigue. And uh, this is such a topic that comes over and over and over again. And to me, is why this fear of, why this fear of missing out affects us uh, as a community, as developers, when taking decisions. And there's even this term, JavaScript fatigue fatigue, which is like, oh, you're tired of people being tired of the ecosystem. I, I don't get that. But if there's one picture that to me describes JavaScript fatigue, it's, it's this one, the one that I made. Um, I'm going to do a very little exercise. So there's around 15 to 16 technologies over there. Raise your hand if you know all these technologies in there. Ah, if there's just similar, you can use be like, eh, this may or may not be from Facebook. 
All right. Raise your hand if you know 10 of them. And so people are like, ah, is that jQuery? I'm like, all right. Raise your hand if you know three of them. So did, did you see that feeling that you had at the very beginning when you were like, crap, like I'm in a JavaScript conference. I don't know any of that. So that, that's a little bit of you know, this tiredness of being overwhelmed by all these technologies. Somehow, like people are like, what is that one? I'm just going to move on. Um, and <laughs> people go and say, they grab a technology, and they say, oh, we don't use that anymore. We need to move on on the next one. And this, this constant iteration of having to learn, of having to move on a, new, a different technology is tiring. This is the concept of you. you it's, it's called JavaScript fatigue. You, you are tired of having to choose all the time what to learn next, what to do things. However, outside of the web ecosystem, what I found is that this is also known as the paradox of choice. And to me, or the best way to describe it, is how the paradox of choice made the web so consistent, fear constantly missing out. Now, the paradox of choice, it's a very cool um, analysis, a uh, psychology analysis made by Barry Schwartz in 2004. And he made an experiment. Um, well, he made the, the, this analysis says that the more choices you are forced to make a person, the more tired this person is. So, and he, he, it's a book about why less is more. Uh, you, you have probably heard that before. And one of the examples that he, made, he makes is, is you cannot see in the, that picture because I just blasted the name over there, but it's a bunch of jams over there. And one of the experiments is that he offers um, two groups of people three jams, and in the two other group of people, 34 jams. And the people that choose between the three of them um, and then actually say how do they taste, some of, most of them are like, oh, they're actually pretty good. And the people that were offered 30-something jams, they actually enjoy it less. And it's, it's not only like just his friends, it's actually a study made by the Harvard University. And the conclusion is that just, um, oh, that got repeated again. Ha! Choices are hard. Choices are tiring. We as developers, as people learning, as advocates, as anyone involved in the, web script, in the JavaScript community or in the JavaScript ecosystem has to make a choice. If I'm going to give a talk about chat, should I talk about Slack? Should I talk about Twilio? Should I pick these choices? And those choices are hard, and we never, or I don't think we always have the information to do that. And Mr. Schwartz makes this case that we are, a lot of the time, either maximizers or satisfiers. And I had found in my experience while working in, in you can guess what, what each of those terms mean. And I have found my experiences are developers that, while working on, with other teams in multiple places in the world, that most of us are maximizers. Most of us, when taking on a project, when giving a conference, when learning, we want to learn the best. We want to pick the best tool for the job. And we research and research and go on, on and see why is this the best tool. And that is tiring. That is, means that if you want to go ahead and go ahead on a project, it will take a little bit of time. Satisfiers are like, meh, let's try Angular, why not? Um, this also affects what I call JavaScript economics. I, I, I bet none of you thought I was going to talk about economics in, in this talk, but it, it does. It does. If I were to tell you, here's the thing. If I were to tell you, don't take screens of that, don't dare you, that I tell React developers earn less money than Angular, Angular wants, can you raise your hand if you believe on that statement? Found the Angular developers. <laughs> Now, how about this one? Flash developer earn less than JavaScript wants. Raise your hand if you believe that one. The one is like, screw yeah, Flash. Of course, because nobody, I mean, I don't know if there's ActionScript developers over here. That's fine. You're in the wrong conference, the ActionScript conference over there. No, but <laughs> the thing is, Flash develop, Flash, after the iPhone decided that, you know, uh, it's screw Flash, we just don't do that thing. Um, JavaScript started gaining momentum, conferences started bringing out. And of course, there was people that were, their entire careers were flash. I complained about two years of learning Angular D Angular JS. There were people that had like flash certifications by Adobe, which I have no idea what it is. I, I only heard about it. But 
imagine that you would spend 10 years working at technology and then suddenly it just changes. It just, it just dies one way. And that is, that is a very hard struggle a lot of people need to face and some people need to move on to new technologies. And that's why always choosing has effect on your career. Um, the tools we choose affect our, our careers. Whether we like it or not, it does. And that's why we always have to be choosing. As long as we don't let, let that, that ability to choose freeze us to just be like, oh, you know, I'm probably earning less money because I don't know uh, Redux or Reflow or whatever re with React goes, um, you're fine because at the end of the day, people really don't care about the tool you're using. You, people just go to a web page, they go to Facebook, and if Facebook works, it's fine if they're just coding HTML and CSS directly to the browser. Um, and here is the question, how do we pick the right tool? And I went through all over the world, and to me, it's just pick a tool based in a problem. Don't do the other way around. In this article that I wrote, I was making the case that the person needed to display a status space of a service. So imagine you want to create a web page that says if Facebook is up or down, right? There's many ways to implement that, but in the article, the person is like, you know what, you're first compiling in TypeScript and just apply some bubble, make sure that Webpack is good, and then you're like, what? you can also do it in jQuery and just ping that every two minutes. That's also fine. As long as you pick the tool based in the problem and not the other way around, you will be completely fine. The other part is JavaScript fatigue is completely different from JavaScript fat. And what I call JavaScript fat. Fatigue is being overwhelmed, as I said, for this paradox of choice of having to pick between these different tools, while JavaScript fat is just JavaScript for the, J for the sake of JavaScript, just trying new tools or new over adding new overhead to your project just because you want to try it, just because you think it's cool, even though it adds zero benefit to the project. And you will find these articles over, all over Hacker News, Reddit, it's like, oh, you know, I found this way to code CSS with JavaScript which, hear me out, might be good, but might be not. Um, you might not need underscore JS, you might not need jQuery. There's this also this web page that show up, like you might not need JavaScript at all. You can just hide buttons everywhere and make sure that the people, when they click on a button, they check buttons, these other things, like that's taking a little bit too much. But you might not necessarily need all the frameworks that you are adding it up to your tool change to get the project done. Um, Whenever a tool is not enough, find new ones. Not earlier, not later. If you are starting a new project, um, start the project with the tools you have at the moment. Don't go and Google what is the best way to do front-end developer 2017. Because if you did it in 2016, you're going to stumble my article, and I'm writing all of them, and you will never start a project. So just start with the things that you know, and eventually when you stumble upon a project, then add a new thing or find or research, not before, because otherwise you will never and you will be, as I say, paralyzed by this paradox of choices. Um, it's always good learning new tools, but never obsess about any. There was not this article that says like, oh, you know, Angular is the, is, is the best thing ever since the world. You have never matched this performance. Well, I think it was React. I don't know. I keep mixing those. React is the best thing. There's no better article. It's, 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 it's um, Back it by Facebook, it has this now boilerplate amazing thing. There are people like really having these feelings for, for a tool, which is a little bit borderline creepy in my very humble opinion. But if you think of tools that we as developers, we interact every day, that is fine. But if you extrapolate that feeling to, let's say, a hammer, then you start to realize it makes no more sense. I don't, I don't see conferences for hammers. I don't see hammer lovers, hammer haters. But that's what those tools are for us. Um, the overhead, the overhead, overhead, the overhead of that one millisecond performance just to learn this new, this new framework might not be worth it. You might, um, again, another example. There was this um, library that was mixing React and Angular JS because why not? And they were amazing, like, look, our, our performance is amazing because it, we are using React's views, but we're using Angular's model, and, you know, we, we just increase the performance for, like, 100 milliseconds. Congratulations, you will never be able to hire any developer for your company because no one in their sane mind will see what code base you use. And, like, oh, we use a hybrid of React and Angular. You're like, eh, 
the doors over there. Because in reality, you just added complexity to the, to the maintainability of the project for very little performance. Maybe you need it, but chances are they're not. Um, when I'm looking to my experience with the startups, and I'm, when I'm looking to, to the startups that, that they work, I, I work initially with this Swiss startup. They raised 50 million in seed capital, one of the biggest founding in, in Europe. They recently got 100 million in, from the Dubai government, the biggest one in Switzerland. And Switzerland is not so big, so it's not that hard. But they also got, when I was working in San Francisco, they, when I was working with they, they raised 44 million from, from bank. The success that I'm seeing is not because of the tool they choose. It's not because they choose Angular. It's not because they choose React. It's because the team that was working with them, with the tools that they had, were better than without the tools that they did have not. Um, I'm going to close the, the JavaScript fatigue before um, dropping five single things I'm cool to do. I just want to drop some Spanish for no reason. Um, just things that are just not necessarily good, and if you if if you were a, if you feel a little bit overwhelmed by all what I said about JavaScript, I think just remember those five things. Um, thing numero uno. So judge a person by a project by the use of a tool. You have no idea when I, when I when I was in San Francisco, I, I met a really skilled designers that they were doing all this fancy animation, but they were using jQuery, right? The J word. And they were like, oh, you know, he will never be a good developer because he uses jQuery. And I'm like, what? Why would you say that? Judging a person based on a, on a tool, or if, if I were to tell you that some of the banking software, because I work in FinTech, you will not believe the dirt you see there, like how JavaScript is there. But you use it every day. It works. You, you don't judge that because of the tools they're doing. Using jQuery is fine. Uh, thing numero dos, uh, blame a tool or worse, the maintainer by their opinions. So one of the things that I was very upset when I wrote this article, I wrote this article as a satire, like completely just analyzing how hard it is to do Angular DS, how hard it is to do uh, these things in 2016. But people were mad. There were people that were, um, I don't remember, I think, um, there was this person uh, that was just like, oh, I hate how people are mad at my framework and template. And I was like, come on. And there were people actually say like, oh my god, Bubble 6 is not compatible with Bubble 5. Uh, what do they think they were doing? It's free. You, you paid nothing for neither of those. Why are you complaining about that? And that's, that's the thing that I don't get. Being, made, being mad at a framework is like being mad at a hammer. You are not going to look at a hammer and you'll be like, oh, where you're asking me to grab you by the handle. Like, no. All right, numero tres, refactor an entire project just because you want to play with new to toys. No, no. Find a new project that you, it's not crucial by the tech, but don't try to use it just because you want to use it. Um, number four, because I'm tired a little bit of Spanish. Interview for a role with a tool in mind for the role. and. This, I think this do it a little bit, both developers and, and recruiters. It's like, I bet I'll, some of you had gotten this email that I'm looking for this rockstar React developer. And that is fine. Uh, but sometimes what that means is that the decision was already taken on how the solution of the problem you don't know has been made. So they may not need React for the problem that they're, they're doing, but they're looking for a React developer. Sometimes that is because the project is mature enough that uh, you need developers that don't want to be on board in this specific technology. But a lot of the times it's because they recruited Google up top five technologies in 2016 and they think the coolest kids use that. Just don't. Um, yeah, that's the first solution, a problem you might not have. And another one is pick an, a tool on all the projects because only you know the tool. So, so far, I may have been trying to tell you, don't learn new tools, don't learn things. And that's not at all the message. Learn all the tools that are out there. It's tiring. You might need a beer or two, but it can be done. That doesn't mean you need to apply all of them, because otherwise you become like the guy that only has a hammer. And you have heard this before. If you only have a hammer, everything looks like a, like a nail. Like me, when I was doing AngularJS, at some point it was like, oh, that just sprinkle some AngularJS in there and then sprinkle some AngularJS in there. And that, at some point, I realized just because I knew AngularJS, I wanted to apply that to, to everywhere. Um, keep learning. Keep growing. 
Awesome. So I'm going to move on um, to a different topic, and we're, we're getting close to the end um, on how, OK, so we saw what all this, these tools are doing to us. I saw why it affects us as developers, as people making decisions, as managers, as people learning new technologies. So how do we recognize and model them? Um, my favorite, uh, my favorite example is this. So this is this is the boilerplate boilerplate for um, developing desktop applications. One thing that is super cool is if you want to develop desktop applications like native applications that your grandma can use in its window computer, you can do it with JavaScript. Uh, but you need to use all this technology. So th this screenshot is like it, it, it uses Electron, React, Redux, Red Router, Reflow, Webpack, React, Transform, HMR. I think it's code reload. I'm not so sure. Um, I'm going to do a quick exercise. Raise your hand if you recognize these nine libraries, frameworks use based on their icon in there. Raise your hand if you recognize all of them. All right? There's like two or three hands. A bunch of liars, because I actually just made up one. Like the previous one, <laughs> one of them was Boomerang from Instagram with like a completely, completely random new one. Those are the actually ones that exist. Um, but that is fine, and that is just because we're, again, we're, we're so overwhelmed, and, and that's completely fine. Some people were like, oh, shit. No, but what I'm trying to say is that um, we, we just need to identify how biased we are as developers when we make decisions, when we are participating, when we're speaking at a conference. As long as we recognize that, we're fine. It's completely fine. Um, one bi There's three biases that I just want to talk before I move it on. Um, confirmation bias. And I was, I was at, at fault of this one for a long time. When I only knew AngularJS, I was just like, is AngularJS better and faster than NoCowJS? Is AngularJS better and faster than jQuery? And of course, I was able to find those articles. There was like this always random guys typing. It was like, oh, AngularJS. I, I actually did in person the quotes thing. So Google actually showed me exactly the title that I needed to find in this D zone random point in the corner. And that allowed me to never, I always, I was having this, this constant uh, echo, ca echo chamber telling me, you know, you're fine, you're fine, Angular yes, is still the best, still the best, still the best. I never realized how biased I was uh, towards the technology. Um, oh my God. Overconfidence bias. Um, so the same way there's imposter syndrome, the way that you feel and you are constantly humble, you're constantly afraid that you are, you're, you're being a fraud, you don't know code enough, there's also the overconfidence bias. And a very good way to identify is, is just, as I said, you know, using the tool that you think is the best. And you always say, no, you know, if we're going to do user management, we always do it with Windows Active Directory because that's the best thing to do it. I have no idea. It could be, it could be true, could be not. But if you only think that is the way that you, you approach that, then of course that's going to be the way. And my favorite one, sunk cost fallacy. And oh boy, this one was hard. So this is used a lot on, on economics and let's say in, in investment. Let's say you invest on a specific, as I say, I work in FinTech, so sometimes I need to poke in there. Let's say you invest in, in, a, in a property, right? And it's suddenly it's 2008 and the house market crashed completely, but you have already invested a lot of money. So instead of pulling out your investment, you double it down. You're like, yeah, it can only go worse. And we do that a lot in, in development. In my case, I just felt that Angular, yes, was the best thing ever. So I'm only going to do that. And I stick, even though I could have maybe used some of that time or do some projects in other technologies and compare them in a fair base, I just decided, you know what, this is, this is, this is the thing. This is the next big thing, and I'm only going to do that. And that is very dangerous. Um, it's very easy to destroy your bias. Just come to conference like this. Talk to other people. Go to your surroundings. Talk to boy, what you guys are using in your startup, what you guys are using in, in your project. Don't always follow the latest newsletters and pick this the latest, uh, the latest article this rom some random guy in San Francisco wrote. Instead, ask your community and the people around how they're doing, and you will find that sometimes there's different solutions to the problem. If you're forcing someone to do something, just ask yourself, are you, ask, are you forcing them because you only found positive evidence? Like, you never look for the cons of your project. You only look for, like, why it's Angular is better. 
Are you only do it because you think it's better without trying another one? Like that's what you know? Are you doing it because you don't know otherwise? Mm, it's not so nice. Make sure if that happens, you're gonna think I'm gonna like crucify you. No, and it's fine. But just realize that you are making a completely biased decision without necessarily having all the latest information. Um, and he, here is here's the catch. At the end of the day, all of us who are working with technology, developers, managers, whatever you want to call it, we're learning to speak with machines. We have already problems speaking with ourselves as humans. We, as my Italian could have probably shown you, um, we, it's not easy speaking with machines. It's not easy making the best decisions on how to do it. We were never, never trained to keep with this much change. We're still, the like, web ecosystem still pretty young. Um, I was very happy to read about like this. The, the GSA started, I think, like 2004, 2010, I think. And I'm pretty sure that conference was completely different of today's conference. And that's just because it changes so much. And as long as we don't blame or we are not so free or, or so uh, hooked up about this feeling, that is completely fine. Being wrong is fine. If you pick a project uh, on Angular and then you're reading all these articles on React.js, it's fine. Maybe the next iteration you will do it better. Learn it. As long as you have this humility to learn this new technology, it's fine. To me, it was very hard. As I said, I, I went from filling this tech lead in this many, many startups and many conferences to just go back to square one to learn TypeScript where I realized my object programming foundations were not strong enough. I had very little fun uh, knowledge on functional programming and I had to pick myself up. Um, we're almost there. You're not being paid to be right. As a developer, you're not, and this to me this is important, you're paid to always do better. The people that you're working on your projects, the people, your clients, your managers, your bosses, the companies, they know that, I hope they know, that at some point you may or may not have some mistake, but that you're always trying to give them, at that point, you find the best solution. We're getting to the end. Awesome. Conclusion, imposter syndrome. You're good. You can always be better, but you're never bad. If you're already in conference like this, if you're already participating in the community, if you're already caring for getting to know what is the latest technology, what people are doing at Uber, Facebook, like we today at the GSA, there's conference, very interesting conference from all different topics. You're already a step forward. You don't know what everything is fine and the tool that you, the choices that you're make are not absolute. Just keep learning and as long as you're in the loop, you're going to be completely fine. JavaScript fatigue. Um, it's just we're, we're victims of being completely overwhelmed by a bunch of jams uh, that are on our table. We will never be happy just because we are constantly faced with thousands of choices. Learn with the ones that are the best for us, um, but don't blame yourself too much. You sometimes might not need half of the jam from the other side. And never, never stop learning. It's part of the, part of the, you know, part of the job. And cognitive biases? Confirmation, overconfidence, and costs affect your judgment. They skew your views on what might be the best for your companies, the best for the company, the best for the products. You are paid to always be learning, not to be right. Um, we're getting very close to this. This is the end of the conference, but I just want to finish with this message. And this conference was, was called, um, I'm good at JavaScript, I swear. Um, but I also want, what I, what I want you to live with is by just trying to learn these new things that we're talking, by trying to understand all these complex topics that we have here, um, you're good at JavaScript as well. And I know it's super cheesy, but I like, I like that message. And yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>